Okay, guys, here's another parable of the Bible. So if you've been sticking with me uh, the last few days, uh, I've been pumping out videos. Uh, I have to show you, you don't have to try to keep up. Yeah, I'm in the middle of Chelsea's video. You don't have to try to keep up with every video I put out. I know I put out a lot of videos during the day. Um, if it wasn't for... If it wasn't for... Um, me going and doing other stuff, going babysitting and all that, I would put out even more videos. Uh, back in 2019, there's sometimes I put out 10 or more videos a day. That's just what I do. Uh, when the inspiration comes, I just start pumping out as much as I can. What I wanted to show you guys is, is you don't have to keep up with every video I put out. Um, because I know I put out a lot and people can't spend all day watching videos. I have playlists for most everything. Uh, morning and evening prayer. The book of Ecclesiastes, which we're going through right now. Parables of the Bible, which I'm a, that's what this video is going to be. This is um, from Michael Pearl, uh, No Greater Joy Ministries, the Door YouTube channel. You are not under the law, Judaizers. Oh, no, wait. Yeah, that's his. Ranty has got his own little playlist here. Um, Banhammer, I did a bunch of Banhammer. I haven't done a Banhammer one in a while. We have uh, started Gad the Seer, um, the Book of Revelation by David Benjamin. I actually have some other videos I need to put in that one. Everything in perspective this was a very interesting couple of videos on a certain particular subject that was a that was actually really actually kind of controversial one I did all the book of Romans that was a great great video series then we have one for repentance here that's Michael Pearl is that Michael Pearls Yeah, that should be Michael Pearls there. Yeah, this one's Michael Pearls, Repentance. This one up here, Judaizers, that's that's the one I did. Um, I've done all the book of Proverbs. And we have the small books of the Bible. These are books that are one to four. That is not what I wanted to click on. Close it. Okay. Small books of the Bible. And it's all the books from one to four chapters. And these books had uh, so many insights. These books in the Old Testament, so many cool insights. Um, this is a real cool playlist. This came out pretty good. Um, I even did a couple of them several times in order to cover all the different things that were going on in there. I think that one got triple set. I'm going to have to go check it. Um, then we have... Just random scripture. That's just a bunch of random videos where I was covering certain scriptures. I actually need to redo that playlist. And I have the book of Revelation. I did a full read-through of the book of Revelation. Um, so these are the playlists you can come and you can check out. You'll be able to slowly work your way through them without having to keep up with all my videos. And I'm trying to get everything organized into the playlist so it's easier to, to deal with them. And I'm probably going to end up spending a day just... In fact, tomorrow I'll probably do the last three chapters of Ecclesiastes and then spend a large portion of the day getting this, some of this stuff fixed and, and organized a little better. Um, uh, I need to go through and check everything. Now you're killing them batteries quick. That's disappointing. <laughs> we got an electric weed eater. It's a Ryobi one. It's battery powered. It's the 18 one. Yeah, she, she's burned through two batteries already and barely weeded in anything. You're working too hard. Okay. Um... Uh, where are we at here? So guys, go into my playlists and, and watch those videos at your leisure. You don't have to try to constantly try to keep up with me. Because I do know I put out a lot of videos. Okay, so we're in Luke. We're going to do the parable of the um, moneylender for giving unequal debt. And this parable starts in verse 41 of Luke 7, but there's actually a pre-story to this. So I want to read the pre-story to this leading up to it because it really helps put it in context and perspective and there's a commentary associated with it too. So I came up here, a sinful woman forgiven. And that's where this parable bounces off of. So we're going to read from verse 36 all the way down to verse 50. This stuff up here is talking about something different. Okay, a sinful woman forgiven. Luke 7, 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. This is a common thing when you had somebody around that would, um, 
they would you would you get invited if you were somebody notable you get invited to come to their house and sit and have a meal with them and you spend the whole evening talking but i think this may have been a setup and behold a woman in the city who was a sinner i don't know why she was designated a sinner when everybody was but they had the law when she, evidently she probably didn't abide by everything of the law when she knew that Jesus sat at the table at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears, and wipe them with the hair of her head, and she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. What she was doing was she realized who he was. She was very aware of who she was and who she needed. She was probably listening to them. They were doing daily readings. They were listening to them read Isaiah and realized this was him. And she was looking for forgiveness. She was looking for answers. A lot of people back then, and even people now, they get stuck in, these, in this lifestyle and in these sins and they can't get out of them. And they don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. She sees Jesus as that light at the end of the tunnel. She wanted out of her situation that she was in. And she knew that the only way was to have her Messiah. That's where her hope was lying is in him. So she was blessing him. This was an incredible blessing that she was doing for him. Now listen to what he says here. The Pharisee gets mad. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. So now back then, Pharisees were very, no, get away from me. If you haven't gone to the temple and given your sacrifice, if you haven't done your, paid your alms and all that stuff, don't touch me. You're, you're dirty. I'll be unclean. So there was a very clear societal separation between certain people. Because there were Jews, the Pharisees. They had the Sadducees. You had the Samaritans that were made to live in the north area, most of them up around the Golan Heights. They weren't allowed to come down in, in some cases. Um, if they were some of the more notable ones, they were required to come to the temple and do their worship there. Most of them were kept out of the city so they were made to go worship elsewhere. Did that parable yesterday. He was talking to that Samaritan woman. So they were like, oh, no, no. Who who dares? Who dares that? I think this was a setup, but it backfired on him. That's just me personally. So he's like, well, if he's a prophet, he'd know. How could he let her do that? Well, it was because Jesus is... He, he brought himself down to our level. He humbled himself. He's not worried about who's touching him because he loves us. Here's the great thing about this. This man's talking to himself inside. He's thinking to himself. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. So this guy didn't realize that he was reading his thoughts. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. So he's starting his parable here in verse 41. So this guy doesn't know Jesus knew his thoughts, knew what he was talking to himself. And he's about to answer this to him and, and fix him, fix his understanding a little bit. <laughs> and when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? So let's read, let's read verse 41 again. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50 denarii. When they had nothing which to repay, he, forgave, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to, uh, has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. See that key word right there, that key ingredient in all this, love? Her sins are forgiven because she loved much. Where else have we seen that verse stated, that, that phrase stated? Love covers a multitude of sins. See, a lot of people get this idea in their head. Well, 
I'm going to be a Christian, so I need to have these gifts. I need to speak in tongues. I need to heal. I need to be a prophet. I need to be an apostle. I need to be this. I need to be that. I need to sing really good. All these things. And not realizing that, just like Solomon saying in Ecclesiastes, it's all vanity. None of that stuff matters. Dressing up and sitting in that church every Sunday, thinking you're a high and mighty Christian, none of that matters. It's vanity for your flesh. It serves no purpose. I would much rather have church sitting in the back of a cargo van than sit in a nice building with all that arrogance and all that pride. Because in that church building, there's a hierarchy. In reality, it's Christ, it's God, it's Christ, and it's us. And those that are denied in those churches, I'm speaking from personal experience, those that are denied in those churches are the greater, yet those in the church don't realize it. Because they're not like them. Those that are made to sit in the back, those that are ostracized, those that are corrected, chided, those that are you know, railed against because of how they dress or what they drive or how they live, those are the greater in the church. Because much more is forgiven them. Just like this woman right here. That other guy, he didn't love Jesus at all. He did nothing for him when he came in. He didn't believe he was the Lord. She did. Verse 48, Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sin? Then he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now do you see why I told the story around the parable? Really puts it in heavy perspective. But listen to these people in verse 49. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sin? They're sitting in the presence of their Messiah, whom they were just reading about in the book of Isaiah in the synagogue, because he even read a part of it. They've been watching for him, because you know they had Daniel, they had his, his book. They were going through the 70-week prophecy. They were counting the days, just like they do now, they did it back then. They were counting the days they knew he was due to arrive. They knew he was supposed to show up right then. They're looking at him. They're eating with him. They're watching him say and do the things the Messiah was going to do that the books told them they were going to do and they still refused to believe that it was him. Because they wanted somebody to come in grand clouds and beams of light with a, with a, a crown on his head and a big old white flowing robe and he was going to come down and he was going to fix everything. He was going to kill all them sinners and he was going to chase everybody off and he was going to make Israel just for the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Mainly just for the Pharisees. And everybody else was going to be made to leave. They are very high minded. That's the Messiah they were looking for. Funny enough, 2,000 years later, that's the Messiah they're going to get. See, all these guys he's talking to right here, these are the ones that had come from that first, they were descended from the people who had come from that first uh, uh, time frame where they were held in captive in Babylon. And they came back into the second temple. These are all descendants of those guys. So all those beliefs came with them. And they were taught these things. They didn't have the original law the way it was intended from Moses. They had a corrupted version. It was rewritten. They had other gods that were brought in. So even back then, they were worshiping Satan. And they didn't know it. They were looking for Satan. And they didn't realize it. How cool is this? How, how awesome is it that Jesus uses a situation that's happening to him and proves to them, one, he's the Messiah. Two, he's exactly who they were looking for. And three, that they were condemned by their own lack of faith and understanding. He didn't condemn them, they condemned themselves. Now who should be the who should be the top dog in the church? Because Jesus did not pick the high end people. 
He picked all the low-end people. God wants, she was an unhewn stone. God wants the unhewn stone. God doesn't want that hewn stone, that, that structured and cultured stone. He doesn't like that. He wants the unhewn stone because he's the one that hewned it. This parable talks about that and this parable proves that. So in this instance, that little bitty parable, those three verses, there's actually an entire story surrounding those. And how awesome to see that what he's looking for is you. Who's forgiven? You. You broken sinner. That you're, you're doubting yourself. You're questioning your salvation. You're struggling to get out of certain sins. You're Christ's. You are who he's looking for. He's not coming for looking for the high and mighty, the choice ones, those who have elevated themselves up. He's looking for all the broken people because they're the ones that need the saving. And it's right here in Luke 7. So go read Luke 7. Read all of it. And look at all the faith that is contained in here. It's astounding. All right, let's read the commentary. What a trio. Christ stands here as a manifestation of the divine love. He's a manifestation of God. But they was really amazing is they didn't know they were looking at the God they were worshiping. As it comes among sinners, the love of God is not dependent on our merits. The love of God is not dependent on our merits, our works, our behavior. Listen to this, Pharisees. Yeah, I'm going to call you Pharisees. Y'all are adding, you're doing the same thing they were doing back then. Listen to what this is saying. The love of God is not dependent on our merits. You obeying the Ten Commandments is not helping you because you don't have any love attached to it. That's great if you can fulfill them, if you want to live by them. Where's your love? Because it does you no good, just like Paul said. Frankly, in Luke 7, 42, and when they had nothing to repay, he forgave them both freely. Frankly, Luke 7, 42 is freely. It is not turned away by our sins. It is not turned away by our sins. Once saved, always saved. It is not turned away by our sins. That means we can't sin enough to lose our salvation like you guys like to think. Like you guys like to treat people and put them back under condemnation. All of y'all, run, run, run from them. It is not turned away by our sins. She is a sinner. It ever manifests itself as the clearing of debts. But it demands recognition and service. Thou gavest me no kiss. Do you have faith? Do you love him? Do you believe? The woman represents those who penitently and lovingly recognize the divine love. She was not forgiven because of her love. But her love was the sign that she had been forgiven and recognized it. What will, what will not God's love do what will, what will not what won't god's love do the tropical sun produces rare fruit what jesus did for her he can do for your many sins pardon will lead to much love and love becomes the gate of knowledge and the source of obedience do you now see how to obey it's not your ability to fulfill the 10 commandments it's not the law it's love And it's always been that. Simon the Pharisee stands for the unloving and self-righteous who are ignorant of the love of God. Hello? They may be respectful in life, rigid in morality, unquestioned in orthodoxy, but what are these without love? There's 1 Corinthians. 
And this is Paul speaking. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not behave rudely, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Let me add one more to that. Though I follow the Ten Commandments and have not love, it's done nothing for me. Note the contrast between thou and she, thy and her. So, where's your love? If you're one of those and that's in that other camp, or you're one of those that has this channel that's looking down on others who don't see things the way you see them, I've had people give me tons of grief and hatred because I believe that Mystery Babylon is Israel. Who cares what I believe? Who cares what you believe? We're still brothers and sisters in Christ if we believe Jesus is the Son of God. Where's the love? Where's the love? If there's no love, it does no good. None of this stuff you have serves you any purpose. That's the only commentary. What an amazing story. What an amazing testimony. And what an amazing commentary. Those who are greatest among you are the worst among you. Because those are the ones who love the most, who are forgiven the most. But we go out of our way to chastise others and to beat them down and to make them feel terrible about themselves and put them back under the chains of condemnation when Jesus did so much, giving his life and shedding his blood to free us from those same bondage. If you're putting people back under bondage, what do you think is going to happen to you when you stand before him? The Bible says, he who leads into bondage will be led into bondage. He who kills with the sword shall die by the sword. That's not talking about prison, and it's not talking about fighting. It's talking about what's going on right here. Understand these parables. Read these scriptures. You guys are missing so much, and yet I'm not watching your videos, but people are coming over here and talking to me about what's going on over there. And they're telling me, you should hear what they're saying. I said, I already know what they're saying. I don't have to go over there. I already know. And the Bible speaks very heavily against what they're doing. But they don't read those scriptures. They see one of those scriptures, they skip right over it. Satan goes, no, you don't need to see that. Run from them. Run, run, run from them. Don't trust anyone, even me, especially me, to give you the proper interpretation. You go read the Bible for yourself and let the Holy Spirit speak to you because if you don't, you are very much doing yourself a disservice. I love you guys very much. I hope you guys are being strengthened by this 
and that your awareness and your understanding is being opened. And by that happening, more love is manifesting inside of you. Because that it's that love, just like this says, just like the commentary said, that love is the manifestation of the forgiveness. It's the manifestation of salvation. It's the evidence. And I'm going to use that word because a lot of people don't like that word. Well, guess what? It's the truth. It's the evidence of your forgiveness. And it says it here. Jesus said it in there. Did you listen to the words? Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. That love was because of her forgiveness. That love was a result of her forgiveness. And this commentator mentions the same thing. Are you saved? Are you truly forgiven? I say, and this is just me, that if you're not operating from a place of love, you've got an issue. And these parables are unfolding these, that type of understanding. Love is the key ingredient, guys. And we're going to see more and more of that manifest. The, the, the separation between the wheat and tares, between those who are saved and those who aren't saved, the separation is very clear, and it's love that's separating those. I bless you all in Jesus' name. I'll see you in the next video.